If it's truly God's kingdom, then God is the one who brings it. Our job is not to build it. It's, it's created by God. It's built by God. And what I would suggest is that we do not merely wait for that future to come, but rather we have an active role to play in anticipating the future. That is, we live in the hope for and expectation of the future. And in fact, the life we live now should be, if you will, colored by that anticipation. It should be affected by that anticipation. Everything we do, the way we look at things, the way we see things should be a reflection or an anticipation of that coming future. So our role is not to build the future, but to anticipate the future that's coming. And I would suggest that, that we see that even in scripture. Pivotal to our relationship with the future is our experience of the indwelling Holy Spirit. In three different passages, in 2 Corinthians and Ephesians, Paul speaks of the Spirit as the first installment of our inheritance. Uh, the word, another word he uses is the deposit or the down payment of the future. In essence, what Paul is saying is that the Spirit is the one who has been given to us to show us what that future is like. So if the future that we imagine, the future that God has promised for us, is one in which we will finally have power over sin, then the Spirit is the one through whom we can experience that here and now. We don't have to say, well, by and by, someday, we'll be able to have power over sin. Actually, that's what the role of the Spirit is now, to give us that, that power. If, if we anticipate that the future is a time of freedom and liberation, then the Spirit is the one through whom we can experience that here and now. The Spirit enables us to experience at least partially what the future will bring in its fullness. So that the love, the grace, and the power of the Spirit enable us to experience now the indwelling presence of God amidst the brokenness of the world in which we live. If you will, that's the theology of, of a hope for the future and how we make that practical in our lives today. It's through the power of the Spirit. And as we as an institution have as our tagline, learn to change the world, it's learning to change the world in anticipation of that future that's coming by the power of the Spirit working in our midst. That's the theological grounding, if you will, of our hope for the future. Cornerstone alumni over the years have been doing this in many different ways, taking what they have learned here and using their newfound knowledge and skills to make the presence of God known in their communities. And as a means of perhaps offering some hope to you, I would like to share a few of their stories that will illustrate how we too can learn to change the world, making God's love, grace, and power evident in a variety of contexts and through a variety of means. I've been very, very selective. I could have shared the stories of many alumni. I've only been able to, I only have time to share a few, but I think it's worth taking a look at a few. The first one I have for you is Dr. Jele Mangangi, a graduate in our BTH in 2004. After pastoring an Assemblies of God church in Soshanguve for 10 years, that's a township outside of Pretoria, Jele was an advanced placement student who came for two years, 2003 and 2004, and was the very first student awarded our Bachelor of Theology. We had just gotten the accreditation for it. He had completed, met all the requirements, and we said, there's no reason that he should not be the first one to receive it. And so in 2004, we awarded Jele a Bachelor of Theology. He came to Cornerstone and majored in psychology because he knew that he needed help dealing with the pastoral challenges and problems that he had faced over 10 years of pastoral ministry. He appreciated, he tells me, not being told what to think here at Cornerstone, but learning how to think. 
And he said he also learned much from mixing with students from other races and cultures, something that his previous pastoral ministry had not permitted. He just simply hadn't had the opportunity to do much of that in his ministry in Sashanguve. There weren't many whites living in Sashanguve at that time, and I doubt there are today. After Cornerstone, Jele pastored several other churches. Uh, he was at the Savannah Assemblies of God, which is near Tembisa, uh, near Midrand, for three years. You can see that the Assemblies of God denomination likes to move the pastors around. He was back in Sashanguve for another three years. Then he went to Orlando, a suburb of Soweto, for three years. And currently he's in Kat Lahang, which is further east from Soweto. Um, but in the last year, he's also planted churches in Santon and Germiston inner city. Um, so he said he's been a very busy man. Uh, he is, in fact, the deputy chairperson of the Assemblies of God in the Eastern Reef, which is comprised of the East Rand, Germiston, and Pretoria areas. And that committee of seven has responsibility for 60 churches in that area. So you can see he's had a significant leadership role within his denomination, um, something that was recognized before he came to Cornerstone, but, but then given the opportunity to continue in that once he finished his studies here. He didn't finish his studies here at Cornerstone. I mean, he finished his BTH with us, but he continued and did a BA Honors in Practical Theology and then an MPhil because they told him with his prior qualification he couldn't get into a regular master's program. But once he finished the MPhil, they said, oh no, you can't go on to a doctorate with that. You now have to do an MTH and so, or an MA. And so he did an MA in theology and then he finally, about two years ago, completed his PhD in systematic theology. So he's been a, one of our more, um, what shall I say, one of our, our more studious students, <laughs> continuing his studies well beyond his time here at Cornerstone. I love that picture of his graduation. When I asked him about Cornerstone's impact on his life and his ministry, he said, the Assembly of God under apartheid divided along racial lines, not intentionally, but simply practically. When starting a church in Santon, it was important to create a church that belongs to all. And he said being at Cornerstone helped him to do this. Jayle said he thanks God for helping him to do a new thing. Jayle lived in the residence hall that we had at the time, and he was affectionately called bishop by his fellow students because of his seniority in pastoral ministry amongst the other students. Um, Jayle is a, is a wonderful brother in the Lord and, and uh, one that I've enjoyed keeping in touch with over the years. Here's another student, Stephanie Van Veek. Stephanie has two years against her name there because she did both our Bachelor of Theology as well as our BA Honors. Uh, finished the first in 2009 and then the second in 2011. Before she even came to Cornerstone, she founded an organization called Beauty for Ashes in 2002, an organization working with offenders and ex-offenders at Polesmoor Prison and in their communities after they left Polesmoor. She also currently runs two halfway homes in observatory, so just around the corner from us here. Stephanie says that after starting Beauty for Ashes in 2002, she enrolled in our Certificate in Community Counseling in 2004, realizing that she did not adequately understand the struggles offenders and ex-offenders were facing. Within the first term, she changed to the degree program. She realized that the certificate wasn't going to be enough, that she needed a lot more. After completing her BA honors at Cornerstone in 2011, she continued and completed a Master of Arts in Psychology at the University of Stellenbosch in 2014. Another one of our academic success stories. 
But she identified a number of challenges that she faced as a student as well as in her ministry. She said returning to varsity as a mature student, competing with younger students whose thinking was quicker and more alert than mine. Really? <laughs> that, that she struggled at times with, with confidence. She was an excellent student, but she didn't always feel that she was able to keep up. She also said keeping your eyes fixed on the goal and constantly hearing God's voice has helped her prevent burnout. She said there are many other voices she's had to focus on making sure she hears God's voice in what she's doing. She also said funding challenges, credibility challenges, and working with very troubled people have been my most pressing challenges. You can imagine running an organization like that with two halfway houses, which have received national recognition, by the way, as, as halfway homes that are successful in doing very good work. Um, has been a huge challenge for her. I asked the people I corresponded with if they had any advice for Cornerstone students who were wanting to learn to change the world, and here's what Stephanie said. You're never too young or too old. Our world, our country, needs innovative thinkers who will take on challenges that are seemingly impossible by worldly standards. During your time at Cornerstone and in all your learning, keep your ears open to what God is particularly saying to you and don't be afraid to start. Sometimes it's that that keeps us back, isn't it? The fear of starting something that seems too big. Stephanie was, was pointed in her reminder that starting small is all it takes. She said, I knew nothing about rehabilitation of offenders of the law when I began this work, but I knew that as a child of God, I could not stand by and complain about crime escalation without trying to do something. See, it's a perspective. She's anticipating a future where those who are in prison are set free. And she's saying, how can I make a difference for those people? She says, you never know what the end will be when you begin by obeying in small areas. I never, ever expected that God would take my small agreement to do just the one thing to the level that it is today. She also said, don't allow others to pour cold water on what you think God is calling you to do. There may be times when you feel like you're the only one who thinks you're hearing God's voice about something. Don't be discouraged. Be obedient to him. And she says, we dream of a new South Africa, really a new world. The task of transformation of society is huge, but all good work begins small. Finally, she said, learn all you can at Cornerstone. You have the privilege of wonderful, dedicated lecturers. Learn from them and learn from the other students around you. This is a community of learning. It's not just learning from lectures to students, but it's learning together as we journey together. Whoops, sorry. She said, I so appreciated the cross-cultural, biodiverse community that Cornerstone is. When I entered the campus of Stellenbosch University for her master's degree, there was a notable difference in the population on campus. So her encouragement to you is start with the small steps. Keep going and make sure you hear God's voice in the process. We also have Cornerstone alumni at Cornerstone. People who've chosen to make a difference <laughs> by, by serving all of you. And Caroline, whose picture is on the right there, is the, the longest serving staff member at Cornerstone currently. Um, in fact, when I was here in 1990 and 91, she was a final year student in 1990. So my, my tenure with Cornerstone is slightly longer than hers, but I took an almost 10 year gap in the middle of it, which she didn't. <laughs> Natalie is also one of our alumni. Moving to the next slide, 
We have two from the basement. I'll let you decide which is the troll and which is the ogre. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> And then we have two more, who I had photos of, who were on staff. <laughs> I don't know, something about psychology, I, that's all I can say. <laughs> Nick Hardwick and Celeste Troy, one of our part-time lecturers this year, but previously a full-time staff member. And then there are a whole lot of names of others who I, whom I didn't have photos of. Beverly Donkers, Grant Nuss, who was up here leading us this morning, Natasha Paris, Celeste Swart, previously Dr. Nadine Bowers Dutoy, who's now a senior lecturer at Stellenbosch, uh, Denver Grigg, who's now working with the Council on Higher Education up in Pretoria, Nicole Joshua, um, I think I may have misspelled her name, but anyway. Cameron Jones, uh, both part-time lecturers. Janine Lange, also a part-time lecturer. Lloyd Williams, Marlon Faura, Debbie Perold, a number of others that are not on the list, not because I wanted to exclude anyone, but because I simply ran out of room. Alumni who have served Cornerstone or are serving Cornerstone and helping to make Cornerstone the kind of learning community that it is today. Making a difference in this place for all of you. So, Cornerstone alumni making a difference. Another one, Richard Lundy, who is a graduate from 2001. At that time, we had a partnership with oh, the gosh. university in which we offered a BA in Christian ministry that was, was accredited by the University of Stellenbosch. So Richard graduated with that BA uh, in the partnership with the University of Stellenbosch, but all of his studies were done on the Cornerstone campus. He married one of our other alumni, Ruth Gibson, who is an alumni from 2003, and they now have two children. After leaving Cornerstone, Richard continued his studies with a BA Honors in Psychology at the University of Stellenbosch, and then subsequently did a diploma in HR through UNISA in 2005. Shortly after he finished his, his uh, honors at Stellenbosch, he joined Oil Reach Out Adolescent Training, which is an organization that was providing peer education, primarily about HIV and AIDS, but about other life skills as well. And did that for, worked with them for a number of years. Currently, he's the general manager of Common Good, an NGO initiative started by Common Ground Church in which he oversees 30 staff members. Richard has worked at and led several nonprofit organizations over the last 12 years, serving 12 different communities in Cape Town. These have been faith-based organizations serving the city's vulnerable and under-resourced communities. Uh, some of those are oil, Ikaya Latemba, Living Hope, and Common Good. I appreciate the fact that two of those have the word hope in them, Ikaya Latemba and Living Hope. Um, and that's really what Richard's purpose has been, is to bring hope to people who often are living at the, the margins of society. He is also a pastor in a local congregation and gets to integrate his faith and vocation on a daily basis. Richard answered a number of questions for me. Um, he said, my heart has been to raise up individuals to make a difference in their own communities. Whether it has been working with teenagers, farmers, entrepreneurs, job seekers, or children in a literacy program, my hope is to build new leaders and servants to positively impact their own neighborhood and community. It's a hope for making a difference in communities. He said that his study of theology and its practical application at Cornerstone has been helpful in his work. Quoting him, he says, through various subjects in psychology, sociology, and theology, there have been many times when my education has prepared me for a grounded approach to reaching those in need. The multicultural context of learning has been particularly helpful. 
because he's worked in very different cultural contexts since leaving Cornerstone. He said, my challenge in my work regarding faith has been trying to engage the local churches in a way that is meaningful. Theology heavily informs how churches get involved in issues of justice. Often justice issues are seen as an add-on and not part of a gospel response and reach into the city. Too often responses to justice are outsourced to external groups without really engaging the typical church member. My hope is that each church is playing its part in the place that God has them in with the people with whom God has blessed them, the communities really in which God has placed them. Do you hear his heart there? It's really a heart for the communities, but also for a heart for the church to take up its role in being a different kind of community to the communities of vulnerable and under-resourced uh, areas. He says, learning to change the world is a journey of growth and development. Every stage of our faith, we are challenged, challenged to trust God, Jesus more, apply our faith in an ever-changing context, and to be the voice of hope and truth to our society. Cornerstone is just the start of that journey of an ever-deepening obedience to God's work in the world. He's been at it for 12 years. I think he would say he has a lot more years to go because he sees that as really the calling that God has given him to make a difference in communities. I'd also like to share with you the story of an anonymous student. He was one of my students back in 1990 and 91. I will leave his name anonymous for reasons I think you'll understand. Um, he completed his diploma in theology in 1992, um, but during the time of his studies here, he was involved in a church in Langa. In fact, he invited me to come and speak at his church at one point. But there were some concerns, particularly in his last year, about what was deemed an inappropriate relationship with a young woman. I don't know the details of it. I don't need to know the details of it. I just know that there was that concern. And it has a bearing on the rest of the story that I'm about to share with you. He returned to Soweto after his graduation, and he became a pastor of a church in Dobsonville. He married in 1995, but he and his wife were separated uh, sometime later after marital difficulties. I think there were allegations or concerns about a possible affair at the time. They later reunited, but it appears the pastor still had an affair with the friend of his wife. In April 2002, he arranged with two others to have his wife killed as part of a staged hijacking outside a mall. Now, as a pastor, what do you do when you don't want to be married to your wife anymore? If you divorce, the church might not accept you any longer. But if your wife dies, then you might be able to continue your ministry. I think that must have been some of the thinking going through his mind. He was convicted of murder in September 2003 and sent to Pretoria Prison, where he is probably still serving his sentence. I wasn't able to get any updated information about him. Last I heard, he was still proclaiming his innocence, although the evidence against him, when the judge ruled on the matter, was, in my opinion, quite conclusive. Uh, among other things, she found his witness to be not credible, partly because he claimed that his wife and he had gone to the mall to have a dinner at a fast food restaurant before the hijacking took place. But in fact, there was no such restaurant at the mall. So the story didn't add up. Now I share this story with you to say not all students who leave Cornerstone go on to do great things. In fact, some go on to do terrible things. Uh, when this story was first brought to my attention, it was brought to my attention by a, one of my subsequent students in an ethics class. I had asked the students to find an ethical issue in a newspaper story or in a movie or film and 
treat it as a case study and respond to it. And one of the students named Patrick brought me this story. <laughs> and I said, really? I know that student. <laughs> and so I presented the case study to the class and we analyzed the ethical issues in the class. Um, and at the end of our analysis, I said, I think there's one ethical issue that you haven't, you haven't recognized here. And that's simply this, could that be you? They all looked at me rather puzzled. Could that be me? I said, yeah, this guy sat where you're sitting about 12 years ago. Could that be you? And I think it reminds us that, in fact, all of us are capable of falling off the rails, of doing things that we might imagine we could never do. And this particular student is one example of that. The next student also had a similar experience, but a different ending. Trevor Pedro came to see us a, a few weeks ago. Um, whilst he was a student at Cornerstone, uh, CEBI at the time, uh, in 1991, he formed an organization called Compassion Corner in response to youth challenges in Hanover Park, which was his, his home. Targeting youth at risk, Compassion Corner offered homework and study support, life skills, personal development camps, and weekly outreach youth programs. He managed to find time to do that whilst he was a student, so uh, there's hope for you. Trevor became, uh, after completing his studies in 92 at Cornerstone, he became the leader of the Cape Flats YMCA, running programs in Hanover Park, Mitchell's Plain, and Bontahivel. Two years later, he became the national youth leader of the YMCA South Africa, helping develop Christian youth leaders around the country. And in fact, his work and ministry was making a difference in the lives of hundreds of kids, of kids across South Africa. If we were to plot his progress, it would appear that it was on a very steep trajectory upward. When asked about, his, about the contribution of CEBI to his career, he said, the amazing lectures and other mentors were significant. He said his family could not afford the tuition but Trevor was given opportunities to work on campus. Does that sound familiar? He and three others actually started their own gardening business to help pay for their fees. And he says about these things, these opportunities built character, discipline, and resilience. Through the reading of books, boy did we read, assignments and tasks, I was introduced to the thoughts, experiences, and theories of others which offered opportunities for the reflection and challenge of my values, belief systems, and view of God. So obviously, Cornerstone had a significant impact on his life. But then he write, writes, at the age of 32, 10 years after my graduation, at the height of my career entering the international youth and community development arena, despite the success and momentum, I had silently and very privately engaged in self-deception sexual immorality and pornography, which led to divorce, which led to alcohol and drug addiction, and eventually to suicidal thoughts. I became completely self-destructive, abusive to my children, and indifferent to God. Upward trajectory, crashing down. He says, my debts grew, Chaos rapidly increased, and one bad decision led to another. I remember asking God if he still remembers me, and if he does, to hear my final request for me to die as I laid awake battling the craving for more drugs. My silent, private relationship with sin became public knowledge, which was followed by expressions of disappointment from others, attempts to provide counseling, lots of advice, and in the midst of all this mess, two former classmates reached out to me in a non-judgmental way and loved me. One of them, Saviwe Minyi, is currently working for Alpha in, in our building here. He was one of, the, one of the two that reached out to Trevor in his time of need. 
Trevor said that his girlfriend of six years invited him to a church service in Manenberg. And six months later, he began a journey of repentance and restoration. He married his girlfriend. They've now been married for eight years. And on his 40th birthday, he and his wife began serving God as pastors of their church in Hanover Park. He writes, there are those who publicly disprove of us being pastors because we've been divorced. The only thing I know for certain is that the grace of God covers the worst and best of me. God's mercy has restored us into an all-embracing relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, the hope of all glory. In the last seven years, we have seen God do amazing things in the lives of people at our family church. We take it one day at a time. In terms of his encouragement to Cornerstone students, he says, be truthful to yourself. Surround yourself with good mentors, men and women who love Jesus and the things of God. Learn from them and follow their counsel. Strive to serve others in your church and community. Know that your challenges in life, your traumatic experiences, your pain, and experiences of brokenness are not an excuse to mess up, to underperform, to be reckless. They are your opportunity to experience God's presence, His grace, and mercy. Pretty powerful advice, I think. Trevor says, this life is a journey full of adventure and great experiences. Protect your innocence. Delay your first sexual experiences until marriage. If you're unmarried and sexually active, stop. Avoid hidden, private, sinful moments. He says, your years at Cornerstone will go very quickly. If you want to change, if you want to change the world around you, if you want to be available for the well-being of someone else, Learn to know him, not just about him. Learn to enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit, not just the emotion of worship. Learn to love him, not your idea of what you think he should do for you. Trevor is currently, um, has a business called TEPO Consulting, of which he's the director, has been for the last four years providing national consultancy, but based here in the Western Cape. Uh, consulting primarily in the areas of youth development and uh, community development. He's also the pastor of Heirs of Salvation Tabernacle, along with his wife in Hanover Park. The hope for communities includes people in many different sectors of society. Educators, I, I'm referring now to other alumni of Cornerstone. They're educators at every level. Preschool, school, TESOL, university, and corporate training. We have business people, media, social networking, IT, legal services, etc. Did you know that one of our alumni was the co-founder of Mixit? Developed that product. I think most of you would know what Mixit is. Um, other alumni have worked in churches as pastors, youth pastors, even church secretaries. Um, we've had many people working with non-government organizations, uh, one called Bottom Up, uh, Learn to Earn, The Message Trust, uh, and many, many more. We've had people working with government. One of our alumni works as a, a research psychologist at a military hospital up in Pretoria. Um, many are working in social development, and we have people working in universities as, as university faculty or staff. And then there are those that have engaged in missional work. One of, our mission, one of our alumni is currently serving as a missionary with YWAM in Lesotho, currently with her husband. Another is in Botswana with WEC. And I mentioned earlier uh, Siviwe, who's with Alpha. And there are others. My final questions for you are simply these. How are you learning to change your world? How do you plan to anticipate the future peaceable, righteous, and just kingdom of God in the things you do here on earth? And let me encourage you, don't lose sight of the fact that you don't have to do everything. 
just the things that are in front of you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that you give us of participating in your work of bringing hope to a world where hopelessness often reigns. We pray that you give us sensitivity to the work of your spirit in our lives, to the leading of your spirit, and that you'd help us to be faithful in doing the little things in being obedient one step at a time. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your grace, as we've heard it evidenced in the stories this morning. You are good, and we celebrate your goodness and look forward to being a part of your peaceable, righteous, and just kingdom. We commit ourselves to these tasks in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.